Chapter 5. A Man Without a Pattern, But with Many Imitators A few pages may perhaps be devoted to those who have preceded Tyndale in the work of translation, but for all practical purposes, as it will be seen, they were of no aid to the work of Tyndale. As an example of the errors of translations, a few specimens may be subjoined, without any attempt at preserving the order of time. Although of a later date they indicate the difficulties that beset the work and the dangers into which the unwary were liable to fall. Among singular editions of the scriptures there is one that was printed in London in 1551, and which is called the Bug Bible, because Psalm 91.5 is printed, Thou shalt not be afraid of the bugs by night. In 1561 an edition of the Bible was printed at Geneva. It is called the Breaches Bible, because of its translation of Genesis 2 verse 7 thus. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves breeches. But this was also done by an edition printed in 1568, in which also Jeremiah 8.22 is rendered, Is there no treacle in Gilead? The word treacle was afterwards altered into rosin, and in 1611 rosin gave place to balm. In one example of the Bible which was printed in 1717, the first line of Luke chapter 20 is misprinted into the parable of the vinegar instead of the parable of the vineyard. It is evident that God left much to the learning and common sense of the men who translated the scriptures, and yet he has so overruled things that upon the whole no serious mistake has long continued in the book of truth. Yet as an instance of the need of care we are told that Eliot, the apostle of the Indians, when translating the scriptures required the Indian word for lattice in Judges 5.28. He crossed his fingers to represent a lattice, and asked one and another what word that meant. They told him, and he put it into the Bible. But when he inquired more of the language, he found that he had actually said, The mother of Sisera looked out of a window and cried through the eel pots. Now, as language constantly changes, there thence arises a need for continuous revision of the translation. In our English tongue, for example, all to once meant altogether or entirely. Anon meant immediately. Bravery meant finery, and not courage. Carriage stood for baggage, or that which could be carried by the hand. As men constantly change their speech, it is evident that we must vary the translation, if it is to be the living voice of God to men. The scriptures probably reached England with the Roman army, and they probably penetrated thence into Scotland. Of course, they were in Latin. The earliest attempt to render this Latin Bible into Saxon was that of Kedman, a monk of Whitby, who lived about the 7th century. His work was indeed more of a paraphrase than anything else. The same may be said of what are called Alfred's Dooms, which are a free translation of the Ten Commandments by that king. In the British Museum there is the celebrated Durham book. It is most beautifully written, and is also ornamented by curious portraits of the evangelists and others. Among other stories that are related of this book, it is said that the monks of Lindensfarne were once flying from the Danes. Their ship was upset, and the Durham book fell into the sea. But through the merits of the patron saint, the tide ebbed out much further than usual, and the book was found three miles from the shore lying upon the sand, but unhurt by the waves. It was therefore placed in the inner lid of St. Cuthbert's coffin, where it was afterwards found, when, in 1104, the monks settled at Durham and built the cathedral. This book is a Latin text, beneath which, 200 years later, an interesting Anglo-Saxon translation was added. Of translations proper, the earliest we know of is that of the Venerable Bede, who died in 735. He was a monk of Jarrow, on the banks of the Tyne, and there his shattered high-backed chair is still preserved. He is said to have been one of the most learned men of his time, to which fact we may attribute the legend that once while he was preaching the stones cried out, Amen, Venerable Bede. An eyewitness has left us an account of his closing days. The scribe was writing the translation from the dictation of the dying man, when, as he finished the last verse of the twentieth chapter, he exclaimed, There remains now only one chapter, but it seems difficult for you to speak. It is, said Bede. Take your pen, dip it in ink, and write as fast as you can. And he did so as rapidly as might be, for life was ebbing fast from the venerable teacher. Now, master, now only one sentence is wanting. Bede repeated it. It is finished, said the writer, laying aside his goose quill. It is finished, said Bede. Lift up my head, let me sit in my cell, in the place where I have been accustomed to pray. And now glory be to the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And so he passed away. His work was done. Other men could copy his translation, and the book that never dies could tell the sweet story of old to men who were then unborn.
one is reminded of Moffat's story, after that he had rendered the word of God into the Sequana tongue. When the heathen beheld the converts reading the new book, they inquired if their friends talked to the book. No, was the answer. It talks to us, for it is the word of God. What then, was the astonished question, does it speak? Yes, said the Christian, it speaks to the heart. It indeed became a proverb among this African people. The Bible turned their hearts inside out. This is its privilege and function. It speaks to the heart, and it turns the heart inside out. The reformers were accustomed to point to the Anglo-Saxon versions as an argument against the Church of Rome, who then permitted what she afterwards forbade. Sir Frederick Madden says, though, of several manuscripts of Anglo-Saxon Gospels that are still in existence, none appear to give the version in its original purity. It is very remarkable, says Dr. Stockton, that the Psalms have in all ages drawn towards them the affections of devout minds, and have been a true cardiphonia to mankind in general, so that in this fact we have a satisfactory answer to objections brought against them in modern times. It is no wonder, therefore, that more attention was paid to them than to other parts of the sacred book, just as a correct instinct leads men now to bind up the Psalms with the Gospels. We pass now to John Wycliffe, the morning star of the Reformation. It is indeed difficult to estimate the magnitude of his wonderful work. All men could see the evil of Romanism, but he alone saw the true remedy, and that was the Book of God in the speech of the people. He was born around 1320 in Yorkshire, and died in Lutterworth in 1384. The carved oak pulpit in which he preached, the plain oak table upon which he wrote, the rude oak chair in which he sat, the robe he used to wear, are all preserved in the little town of Lutterworth, in the church of St. Mary, on the bank of the River Swift. Of this church he had been appointed rectory by King Edward, as a reward for his service as ambassador, when he met the representatives of the Pope at Bruges. This was in 1734. One loves to picture this remarkable man pursuing his biblical toils, now in his Lutterworth rectory, then in his college at Oxford, working in the winter nights by his lamp, and early in the summer's morn as the sun beamed through his window. We see him with his long gray beard, sometimes alone, bending over the parchment manuscript, carefully writing down some well-labored rendering, and sometimes in company with others who sympathized in his sentiments and loved to aid him in his hallowed enterprise. He is supposed to have commenced his work about 1378, and to have finished it about 1380, though the latter date is by some assigned to the New Testament alone. He began with the translation of the Book of Revelation, then to the Gospels in English with a commentary, and the other sacred books followed at unknown periods. This translation was from the Latin Vulgate by Jerome. It was multiplied and widely read by the people. Preachers went up and down the country explaining it to the crowds who attended them. It seemed indeed as if the Reformation were to come in the 14th century, instead of 200 years later. But just as in spring we often see a frost nip off the plentiful blossoms, so persecution put back the fair promise of fruit for a long time. An attempt was made to destroy these translations of the Scripture, and yet, in spite of the many which were then destroyed, nearly 170 manuscripts of this period remain to us. After escaping the malice of his enemies, Wycliffe died at home. Admirable, says Fuller that a hare so often hunted with so many packs of dogs should die at last, quietly sitting upon his form. The Council of Constance in the next century, after burning, Wycliffe's disciple Huss ordered that Wycliffe's bones should be disinterred and burned, and with contemptible spite they further decreed that the ashes were to be thrown into the river Swift. Thus, says Fuller, this book hath conveyed his ashes into Avon, Avon into Severn, Severn into the narrow seas, they into the main ocean and thus the ashes of Wycliffe are the emblems of his doctrine, which now is dispersed all the world over. John Purvey, or Purney, who had lived with Wycliffe to revise his master's work. It was Purvey who first termed the sacred book by its now familiar name. This version had even a wider circulation than the first, and from its influence arose the Lollard movement. This was both a religious and a political revolution. It was an attempt to obtain reform both in the church and in the state. It was a movement of all ranks, even among monks and nuns, alas, without success. In 1408, a convocation at Oxford enacted a law which forbade a translation of scriptures into English, and warned all persons against reading such books under penalty of excommunication. At this time, a New Testament was worth two pounds, sixteen shillings, eight, or about forty-five pounds, six shillings of our money. At this period, we are told that a decent, respectable man could live well upon five pounds per year. 
Writing was tedious, slow, liable to error, and expensive, so that the number of copies was limited. But about 1440, or 60 years after Wycliffe, the printing press was invented. One of the first books that was printed was a Latin Bible. One edition was sold some years ago for 34,000 pounds. Another realized 2,000 pounds. In 1477, William Caxton brought this new art to England, and in Westminster Abbey he printed books under the protection of King Edward IV. We have thus sketched briefly the history of the previous versions, and have come in the order of time to Tyndale's version of the Testament, which Tyndale translated under so many difficulties. F. W. Faber, a Romanist, says, We will say that the uncommon beauty and marvelous English of the Protestant Bible is not one of the strongholds of heresies in this country. It lives on the ear like music that can never be forgotten, like the sound of church bells, which the convert hardly knows how we can forgo. Its felicities often seem to be almost things rather than mere words. It is part of the national mind and the anchor of national seriousness. Nay, it is worshipped with a positive idolatry, in extenuation of whose gross fanaticisms its intrinsic beauty pleads availingly with the men of letters and the scholar. The memory of the dead passes into it. The potent traditions of childhood are stereotyped in its phrases. The power of all the griefs and trials of a man is hidden beneath its words. It is the representative of his best moments, and all that there has been about him of soft and gentle and pure and penitent and good speaks to him forever out of his English Bible. It is his sacred thing, which doubt has never dimmed and controversy never soiled. It has been to him all along as the silent, but oh how intelligible, voice of his guardian angel. And in the length and breadth of the land there is not a Protestant with one spark of religiousness about him whose spiritual biography is not in his Saxon Bible, to which may be added the testimony of the present Bishop of Durham, who speaks of Tyndall's work thus. In rendering the sacred text, he remained throughout faithful to the instincts of a scholar. From first to last, his style and interpretation are his own, and in the originality of Tyndale is included in a large measure the originality of our English version. For not only did Tyndale contribute to it directly the substantial basis of half the Old Testament, in all probability, and of the whole of the New Testament, but he established a standard of biblical translation which others followed. It is even of less moment that by far the greatest part of his translation remains intact in our present Bibles, than that his spirit animates the whole. He toiled faithful himself, and where he failed he left to those who should come after the secret of success. His influence decided that our Bible should be popular, and not literary, speaking in a simple dialect, and that so, by its simplicity, it should be endowed with permanence. Mr. Froude's testimony may perhaps be added here, not because it is requisite, but as the historian's tribute to a noble man. Of the translation itself, though since that time it has many times been revised and altered, we may say that it is substantially the Bible with which we are all familiar. The peculiar genius, if such a word may be permitted, which breathes through it the mingled tenderness and majesty, the Saxon simplicity, the preternatural grandeur, unequaled, unapproached in the attempted improvements of modern scholars. All are here and bear the impress of the mind of one man, William Tyndale. As an example of this identity, we take a passage from Tyndale's version. The words in italics remain as Tyndale placed them in both the authorized and revised versions. The passage that we selected is Matthew 18, 9-27. Again I say unto you, that if any of you shall agree on earth in any manner thing whatsoever they shall desire, it shall be given them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Then came Peter to him and said, Master, how oft shall my brother trespass against me, and I shall forgive him? Shall I forgive him seven times? Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee seven times, but seventy times seven times. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him ten thousand talents. But when he had not to pay, the Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife, and his children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. The servant fell down and besought him, saying, Sir, give me respite, and I shall pay it every whit. Then had the Lord pity on the servant, and loosed him, and forgave him the debt. It has been estimated that there are not more than three hundred fifty words in the whole book that are strange to us now so that Tyndale would be justly regarded as one of the builders of our language. Of the Quattro Testament, which were completed at Worms after the hurried flight from Cologne, only one fragment remains, and that is deposited in the British Museum. It consists of thirty-one leaves only, 
and terminates at the 12th verse of the 22nd chapter of St. Matthew. It was discovered in the year 1836 by a London bookseller, bound up with a track by Eclome Padius. This fragment is all that remains of the 3,000 copies in Quattro, which were commenced at Cologne and completed at Worms. Of the 3,000 octave testaments, which, though commenced at Worms, were issued probably before the Quattro, one perfect copy is preserved in the library at the Baptist College in Bristol. This book was purchased for the Earl of Oxford about the year 1740, and he rewarded the agent who discovered the treasure with a donation of ten pounds, and an annuity of twenty pounds per year. This latter annuity was paid for fourteen years, so that the total cost of the book to the Earl was two hundred ninety pounds. At the death of the Earl of Oxford, his library was purchased by Osborne, the bookseller, for less money than the bindings had cost their collector. Osborne, in turn, sold the book for fifteen shillings. Then it came to the hands of Dr. Gifford, a Baptist minister, who bequeathed it to the college in his native town. In the same college, amongst many other biblical treasures and curiosities, is a copy of what is called the Droll Error Tyndall. It is a handsome volume, well printed upon good paper, but full of printer's blunders. Amongst them is that which is given a name to this edition. Thus, Second Corinthians 10, instead of, Let him that is such think on this wise, the printer has put, Let him that is fuss think on his wife. This book is supposed to be later in date than either the octave or quattro editions, but it may be perhaps more conveniently referred to here. The spirit in which the work of translation was undertaken by Tyndale appears in his prologue. I have translated, brethren and sisters most dear and tenderly, beloved in Christ, the New Testament for your spiritual edifying, consolation, and solace, exhorting instantly and beseeching those that are better seen in the tongues than I, and that have higher gifts of grace to interpret the sense of Scripture and the meaning of the Spirit than I, to consider and ponder my labor, and that with the Spirit of meekness, if they perceive in any places that I have not attained the very sense of the tongue or meaning of the Scripture, or have not given the right English word, that they may put to their hands to amend it, remembering that so is their duty to do. For we have not received the gift of God for ourselves only, or for to hide them, but for to bestow them unto the honoring of God and Christ, and edifying of the congregation, which is the body of Christ. Of Tyndale's qualifications for his work there can be no doubt whatever. Bushes, a distinguished German scholar, speaks of him as so skilled in seven languages, Hebrew, Greek, Latin, Italian, Spanish, English, French, that whichever he spoke you would suppose it his native tongue. The Greek text that he followed in his translation was, of course, that which Erasmus had given to the world, and although Tyndale was evidently more familiar with the second, he now and then uses the third edition. At the same time, it has been shown by Demas that, as he proceeded in his undertaking, Tyndall had before him the Vulgate, the Latin version of Erasmus, and the German of Luther, and that in rendering to the original Greek, he carefully consulted all these aids. But he did so not with the helpless imbecility of a mere tyro, but with the conscious independence of an accomplished scholar. At the same time, it is but justice to bear in mind that some of the alleged faults of our versions are due to Tyndall. The manner in which he translates the same Greek word differently in the same connection, and sometimes in the same verse, adds indeed to the beauty, but it diminishes the force of the book. But the most heinous offense in the eyes of the papist, after his translating the scripture at all, was putting of notes in the margins. Of these we select a few examples. Whatsoever ye bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Tyndale says, Here all bind and loose. Besides the words, If thine eyes be single, all thy body is full of light, he writes, The eye is single, when a man in all of his deeds looketh but on the will of God, and looketh not for land, honor, or any other reward in this world, neither ascribeth heaven nor a higher room in heaven unto his deeds, but accepteth heaven as a thing purchased by the blood of Christ, and worketh freely for love's sake alone. All good things cometh of the bountifulness, liberality, mercy, promises, and truth of God, by the deserving of Christ's blood alone. He that hath, he thus expounds, where the word of God is understood, there it multiplieth, and maketh the people better. Where it is not understood, there it decreaseth, and maketh the people worse. These notes, as we shall see, were subsequently omitted, but it is easy to see that they were calculated to give severe offense to the Romish authorities. Chapter 6. Hated by the Cardinal, but working for God. Tyndale, it is supposed, reached Worms after his hurried flight to Cologne about October 1525, and there he remained for two years. 
Until the following April or May, he would be fully occupied with the labor which the issuing of the 3,000 octave and the 3,000 quattro testaments from the press involved. Immediately that this was accomplished, he parted cheerfully from his troublesome friend, William Roy. It has been supposed that during his residence in Worms, Tyndall gave himself to the study of Hebrew as a qualification for the work of his translation. In the year 1528, he left Worms for Marburg, which, under the rule of Landgrave Philip, was one of the most eminent of the Protestant cities of Germany. Here, the work of the Reformation has been more thorough than in any other part of the empire, as the Landgrave himself was a believer in Zwingle's doctrine. Here, Tyndale was both in safety and yet in the society of learned men, who were able to assist him in his arduous enterprise. For though Landgrave had done his very utmost to attract men of piety and letters to his capital, and the Reformed flocked to it as a second metropolis of religion, and as next to Wittenberg. Here Tyndale met with the heroic Patrick Hamilton and the other young men from Scotland, and here also he conversed with Barnes, who was then a fugitive from the papal persecution which still raged in England. Sir Thomas More declared that Barnes then induced Tyndale to abandon the Lutheran view of the sacrament, and his testimony is probably correct. In his confutation he says, Friar Barnes was of Zwingla's sect against the sacrament of the altar, believing that it is nothing but bare bread. But Tyndale was yet at that time not fully fallen so far in that point. But though he was bad enough inside, he was yet not content with Friar Barnes for holding of that heresy. But within a while after, as he that is falling is soon put over, the friar made the fool mad outright, and brought him down into the deepest dungeon of that devilish heresy, wherein he sitteth now fast bounden in the chair of pestilence, with the chain of pernacity. The diction and the spirit are certainly not to be commended, but Sir Thomas More sometimes endeavoured to compensate for a bad cause by virulent abuse. We shall have occasion to refer again to some of his coarse expressions with regard to the reformers, and therefore we now only notice the fact that while at Marburg, Tyndale adopted the Zwinglian view of the sacrament. But a better companion than Barnes now came to comfort and sustain him, he was John Frith, whom Tyndale called his own son in the faith. In him Tyndale found a man after his own heart, and the intercourse of the two friends was probably a mutual joy. About the time of Frith's arrival in Marburg, Tyndale issued a book which created as great a sensation as England as his testament had done. This is the book which is generally known as The Wicked Mammon, or more fully, The Parable of the Wicked Mammon. The Wicked Mammon is really an exposition of the parable of the unjust steward. Tyndale's main purpose in the book, however, was to set forth the cardinal doctrine of justification by faith, but in doing so, he naturally assailed the gross errors of Rome. In his preface, Tyndale boldly declares the Pope to be Antichrist, an assertion which requires much courage at the time, and said, We have spied out Antichrist long enough, if we had looked in the doctrine of Christ and his apostles, where, because the least seeth himself now to be sought for, he roareth and seeketh new holes to hide himself in and changes himself into a thousand fashions, with all manner of vileness, falsehood, subtlety, and craft. Because that his excommissions are come to light, he maketh it treason unto the king to be acquainted with Christ. If Christ and they may not reign together, one hope we have, that Christ shall live for ever. The old Antichrist brought Christ into Pilate, saying, By our law he ought to die. And when Pilate bade them judge him after their law, they answered, It is not lawful for us to kill any man which they did to the intent that they which regarded not the shame of their false communications should yet fear to confess Christ, because that the temporal sword had condemned him. They do all things of a good zeal, they say. They love so well that they would rather burn you than that you should have fellowship with Christ. They are jealous over your armies, as saith St. Paul. They would divide you from Christ and his holy testament, and join you to the Pope to believe in his testament and promise. The New Testament had been issued without Tyndale's name upon it, but at length the secret of his authorship had leaked out. Now, with a sublime scorn both for the prelates and for their malice, Tyndale continues, Some men will ask for a venture why I take the labor to make this work, inasmuch as they will burn it, seeing they burnt the gospel. I answer, in burning the New Testament they did none other thing than that I looked for. No more shall they do if they burn me also. If it be God's will, it shall so be. Then Tyndale concludes his preface, saying, Nevertheless, in translating the New Testament, I did my duty, and so do it now, and would do as much more as God hath ordained me to do, and as I offered that to all men to correct it, whosoever could, even so I do this. Whosoever therefore readeth this, compare it unto the Scriptures, 
If God's word bear record unto it, and thou feelest in thine heart that it is so, be of good comfort and give God thanks. If God's word condemn it, then hold it accused, and so do with other doctrines. As Paul counseleth his Galatians, Believe not every spirit suddenly, but judge them by the word of God, which is the trial of all doctrine, and lasteth for ever. Amen. That precious thing, which must be in the heart, ere a man can work any good work, says Tyndale, is the word of God, which in the gospel preacheth, proffereth, and bringeth unto all that repent and believe the favor of God in Christ. Whoso heareth the word and believeth it, the same is thereby righteous. Therefore it is called the word of life, the word of grace, the word of health, the word of redemption, the word of forgiveness, and the word of peace. For of what nature soever the word of God is, of the same nature must the hearts be which believe therein and cleave thereunto. Now is the word living, pure, righteous, and true, and even so maketh it the hearts of them that believe thereon. Upon the duty of every man to help and to love his neighbor, Tyndale is very emphatic, and his teachings are beautifully illustrated by his own self-denying life. It is a wonderful love wherewith a man loveth himself. As glad as I would be to receive pardon of mine own life, if I had deserved death, so glad all like to be to defend my neighbor's life without respect to my life or my goods. A man ought neither to spare his goods nor yet himself, for his brother's sake, after the example of Christ. He even goes so far as to say, If thy neighbor need, and thou help him not, being able, thou withholdest his duty from him, and art a thief before God. Every Christian man to another is Christ himself, and thy neighbor's need hath as good right in thy goods as hath Christ himself, which is heir and lord of all. And look what thou owest to Christ, that thou owest to thy neighbor's need. To thy neighbor owest thou thine heart, thyself, and all that thou hast, and canst do. Thus is every man that needeth thine help, thy father, mother, sister, and brother in Christ, even as every man that doeth the will of the Father is father, mother, sister, and brother unto Christ. Probably no Christian writer in that age would have dared to have written such words as the following, for the spirit of national hostility was very strong, and the persecuting mania was terribly prevalent. Moreover, if any be an infidel and a false Christian, and forsake his household, his wife, children, and such as cannot help themselves, then art thou bound, if thou have therewith, even as much as to thine own household, and they have as good right in thy goods as thou thyself. And if thou withdraw mercy from them, and hast wherewith to help them, thou art a thief. If thou show mercy, so doest thy duty, and art a faithful minister in the household of Christ, and of Christ shalt thou have thy reward and thanks. Such doctrine was far in advance of the age, but it is interesting to note how thus, as in some other things, Tyndale was far ahead of his contemporaries. Simultaneously with the wicked mammon, Tyndale issued another work, which was almost of as much importance to the Reformation as was his Bible. It is entitled The Obedience of a Christian Man and it is both a defense of the reformers from the charge of sedition, and also a call to them to persist in the path of duty, in spite of persecution. Adversity I receive at the hand of God is a wholesome medicine, though it be somewhat bitter, said Tyndale. O oh, Peter, Peter, he exclaims, when speaking of the sins of the clergy, thou wast too long a fisher, thou wast never brought up the archers, neither wast master of the rolls, nor yet chancellor of England. The parson sheatheth, the vicar shaveth, the parish priest pilleth, the friar scrapeth, and the pardoner pareth. We lack but a butcher to pull the skin. He concludes with these noble words, Remember that Christ is the end of all things. He only is our resting place. He is our peace. For as there is no salvation in any other name, so there is no peace in any other name. Thou shalt never have rest in thy soul, neither shall the worm of conscience ever cease to gnaw thine heart, till thou come to Christ, till thou hear the glad tidings, how that God for his sake hath forgiven thee all freely. If thou trust in thy works, there is no rest. Thou shalt think, I have not done enough. If thou trust in confession, then shalt thou think, have I told all? Likewise, in our holy pardons and pilgrimages, gettest thou no rest. As pertaining to good deeds, therefore, do the best thou canst, and desire God to give strength to do better daily. But in Christ put thy trust, and in the pardon and promises that God hath made thee for his sake, and on that rock build thine house, and there dwell. Such words were well calculated to stimulate and to comfort the persecuted, and it is therefore no wonder that they introduced an element into English religious life that was most important, and unhappily infrequent before. Blaney, for example, had recanted, but after suffering long in acute distress of mind, he came at length to some quiet of conscience, 
being fully resolved to give over his life for the confession of that truth which before he had denounced, he took his leave in Trinity Hall of certain of his friends, and said he would go up to Jerusalem. And so, setting forth on his journey towards the celestial Jerusalem, he departed from thence to the anchoress in Norwich, and there gave her a New Testament of Tyndale's translation, and the obedience of a Christian man, whereupon he was apprehended and carried to prison, there to remain till the blind Bishop Nix sent up for a writ to burn him. Of Bainham, who was another who had abjured, Fox says that he was never quite in mind or conscience until the time he had uttered his fall to all his acquaintance, and asked God and all the world forgiveness. And the next Sunday, after he came to St. Austin's with the New Testament in his hand in English, and the obedience of a Christian man in his bosom, and stood up before all the people in his pew, there declaring openly, with weeping tears, that he had denied God. After this he was strengthened above the cruel death by fire, with remarkable courage. This book came into the hands of the King of England himself, and Stripe thus relates the incident. Upon the Lady Anne Boleyn waited a fair young gentlewoman named Mrs. Gainsford, and in her service was also retained Mr. George Zouch, father to Sir John Zouch. This gentleman, of a comely sweet person, was a suitor in way of marriage to the sad young lady and among other love-tricks once he plucked from her a book in English, called Tyndale's Obedience, which the Lady Anne had lent her to read, about which time the Cardinal had given commandment to the prelates, and especially to Dr. Simpson, Dean of the King's Chapel, that they should keep a vigilant eye over all people for such books, that they came not abroad, that so, as much as might be, they might not come to the King's reading. But this which you most feared fell out upon this occasion, for Mr. Zouch was so ravished with the Spirit of God, speaking now as well in the heart of the reader as first it did in the heart of the maker of the book, that he was never well but when he was reading of that book. Mrs. Gainsford wept because she could not get the book from her wooer, and he was as ready to weep to deliver it. But see the providence of God. Mr. Zouch, standing in the temple before Dr. Simpson, ever reading upon his book, and the dean, never having his eye off the book in the gentleman's hand, called to him, and then snatched the book out of his hand, and asked his name, and whose man he was, and the book he delivered to the cardinal. In the meantime the Lady Anne asketh her woman for the book. She, on her knees, told all the circumstances. The Lady Anne showed herself not sorry, nor angry with either of the two, but she said, Well, it shall be the dearest book that ever the dean or cardinal took away. The noble woman goes to the king, and upon her knees desireth the king's help for her book. Upon the king's token the book was restored and now, bringing the book to him, she besought his grace most tenderly to read it. The king did so, and delighted in the book, for saith he, This book is for me, and all kings to read. And in a little time, by the help of this virtuous lady, had his eyes opened to the truth, to search the truth, to advance God's religion and glory, to abhor the Pope's doctrine, his lies, his pomp and pride, to deliver his subjects out of the Egyptian darkness, the Babylonian bonds, that the Pope had brought him and his subjects under. Wyatt repeats the story with some interesting variations, for he says that Anne was but newly come from the king, when the cardinal came in with the book in his hands to make complaints of certain points in it that he knew the king would not like, and withal to take occasion with him against those that countenance such books in general, and especially women, and as might be thought with mind to go further against the queen more directly, if he had perceived the king agreeable to his meaning. But the king, that somewhat afore disliked the cardinal, finding the notes the queen had made, all turned the more to hasten his ruin, which was also furthered on all sides, so that the cardinal in reality digged a pit and then stumbled into it, and Henry for once in his life read and admired the faithful setting forth the truth. Alas, that Tyndale's own obedience should be unto death, for so it proved to be with him. In 1530 Tyndale left Marburg and returned once more to Hamburg. During the same year he also published another book, which he entitled The Practice of Prelates. In this book occurs the famous similitude, which we here subjoin. And to see how our holy father the Pope came up, mark the example of an ivy tree. First it springeth out of the earth, and then a while creepeth along by the ground till it findeth a good tree. Then it joineth itself beneath a low unto the body of the tree, and creepeth up a little, and a little, fair and softly. And at the beginning, while it is yet thin and small, that the birth is not perceived, it seemeth glorious to garnish the tree in the winter, to bear off the tempest of the weather. But in the mean season it thrusteth roots into the bark of the tree to hold fast withal, and ceaseth not to climb up till it be at the top, and above all. And then it sendeth his branches along by the branch of the tree, and overgroweth all, and waxeth great, heavy, and thick, 
and sucketh the moisture so sore out of the tree and his branches, that it choketh and stifleth them. And then the foul stinking ivy waxeth mighty in the stump of the tree, and becometh a seat and a nest for all unclean birds, and for blind owls which hawk in the night, and dare not come at the light. Even so the bishop of Rome, now called Pope, at the beginning, crope along upon the earth, and every man trod upon him in, it, in this world. But as soon as there came a Christian emperor, he joined himself unto his feet and kissed them, and crope up a little with begging, now this privilege, now that, now this city, now that, to find poor people withal, and the necessary ministers of God's word. And he entitled the emperor with choosing the pope and other bishops, and promoted in the spirituality, not whom virtue and learning, but whom the favor of great men commendeth, to flatter, to get friends and defenders withal. And the alms of the congregation, which was the food and patrimony of the poor and necessary preachers, that he called St. Peter's patrimony, St. Peter's rent, St. Peter's lands, St. Peter's right, to cast a vain fear and an heathenish superstitiousness into the hearts of men, that no man should dare meddle whatsoever came once into their hand, for the fear of St. Peter, though they ministered it never so evil, that they which should think it none alms to give them any more, because they had too much already, should yet give St. Peter somewhat, as Nebuchadnezzar gave his god Baal, to purchase an advocate and an intercessor of St. Peter, and that St. Peter should at the first knock let them in. And thus with flattering and feigning and vain superstition, under the name of St. Peter, he crept up and fashioned his roots in the heart of the emperor, and with his sword climbed up above all his fellowships, and brought them under his feet. And as he subdued them with the emperor's sword, even so by subtlety and help of them, after that they were sworn faithful, he climbed above the emperor, and subdued him also, and made stoop unto his feet, and kissed them another while. Yea, Pope Closinus crowned the emperor Henry V, holding the crown between his feet, and when he put the crown on he smote it off with his feet also, saying that he had might to make emperors, and to put them down again. And he made a constitution that no layman should meddle with their matters, nor be put in their councils, or wit what they did, and that the pope only should call the council, and the empire should but defend the pope, provided also that the council should be in one of the pope's towns, and where the pope's power was greater than the emperor's. Then, under a pretense of condemning some heresy, he called a general council, where he made one a patriarch, another cardinal, another legate, another primate, another archbishop, another bishop, another deacon, another archdeacon, and so forth, as we now see. And as the pope played with the emperor, so did his branches, his members, the bishops, play in every kingdom, dukedom, and lordship, insomuch that the very heirs of them, by whom they came up, hold now their lands of them, and take them for their chief lords. And as the emperor is sworn to the pope, even so every king is sworn to the bishops and prelates of his realm, and they are the chiefest in all parliaments, yea, they and their money, and they that be sworn to them, and come up by them rule together. And thus the pope, the father of all hypocrites, hath with falsehood and guile perverted the order of the world, and turned the roots of the tree upward, and hath put down the kingdom of Christ, and set up the kingdom of the devil, whose vicar he is and hath put down the ministers of Christ, and hath set up the ministers of Satan, disguised, yet in names and garments, like unto the angels of light and ministers of righteousness. For Christ's kingdom is not of the world, and the Pope's kingdom is all the world. But Tyndale was not only active in his attack upon error, he was not less indefatigable in promulgating truth. For on the 17th of January in the same year, 1530, he issued from the press his translation of the Pentateuch, the notes in the margin in this translation are even more vigorous than those in the New Testament. Thus Tyndale said, To bless a man's neighbor is to pray for him, and to wish him good, and not to wag two fingers over him. If we answer not our prelates, when they be angry even as they would have it, we must to the fire without redemption or forswear God. Upon Exodus 34.20, None shall appear before me empty, Tyndale says, that is a good text for the Pope. To Balaam's question, how shall I curse when God hath not cursed, Tyndale notes, The Pope can tell how. Such words are not to be considered without due reflection as to the circumstance under which they were written. Tyndale had been long in exile, and he knew the plots been again and again laid to entrap him. Although for a time he might hope to elude his persecutors, he knew well that eventually he must fall a victim to their cruelty, as many others had done before him and he believed himself to be called of God for the purpose of combating the gigantic form of error that, like Apollyon, straddled right across the king's highway, and withstood the pilgrims in the way to the celestial city. 
Yet, although some may not approve of the notes, the counsel that is given in the prologue to Genesis will be read by all spiritual Christians with unqualified approval. Though a man had a precious jewel and rich, yet if he wist not the value thereof, nor whereof it served, he was neither the better nor richer of a straw. Even so, though we read the scripture, and babble of it never so much, yet if we know not the use of it, and whereof it was given, and what is therein to be sought, it profiteth us nothing at all. It is not enough, therefore, to read and talk of it only, but we must also desire God, day and night, instantly, to open our eyes, and to make us understand and feel whereof the scripture was given, that we may apply the medicine of scripture, every man to his own sores. Unless that we intend to be idle disputers and brawlers about vain words, ever gnawing upon the bitter bark without, and never attaining to the sweet pith within. Chapter 7 Not Second to a Gladiator, or Strong for the Truth Tyndale, of course, was not suffered to continue his labors unassailed, for no less an antagonist than Sir Thomas More entered the list against him. Whatever may be More's claims to admiration, it must ever be considered to be a foul blot upon his character that he assailed Tyndale with low, scurrilous abuse. As early as the year 1528, Tunstall, the polished Bishop of London, who had previously so unceremoniously rejected Tyndale's offer of service, wrote to More inviting him to undertake the task of stemming the tide of heretical books, which, in spite of his utmost endeavors, continued to flow into England. For as much, said the bishop, as much as you can play the Demosthenes both in our native tongue and in Latin, and are wont to be a most zealous defender of Catholic truth in every assault, you will never be able to make a better use of any spare hours that you can redeem from your occupation than by publishing in our native tongue something that will expose even to rude and simple people the crafty malice of the heretics, and make them better prepared against these impious enemies of the Church. Copies of the books to which he was to reply were forwarded to Moore and the Chancellor was reminded of the example of his monarch, who had won the title of Defender of the Faith by his book against Luther. More readily complied with this request, and after a year of study he published a large volume which specified Luther and Tyndale as his chief objects of attack. The book is in the form of a dialogue, which is, of course, a most convenient form of eluding an awkward attack. Look on, says Sir Thomas More, how in his wicked book of mammon, and after in his malicious book of obedience, he showed himself so puffed up with the poison of pride, malice, and envy, that it is more than marvel that the skin can hold together. He knoweth that all the fathers teach that there is the fire of purgatory, which I marvel why he feareth so little, as if he be at a plain point with himself to go straight to hell. Anderson, in his Annals of the Bible, in speaking of this attack of More, says, The English language has never been so prostituted before Sir Thomas More took up the pen. No solitary selected expressions can convey an adequate idea of the virulence, nor to say the verbosity and fallacious reasoning of this writer, and the majority of unbiased readers would probably endorse this severe verdict. Sir Thomas More's book was published in June 1529, and during the year of 1531, Tyndale published his reply to it, an answer which must be admitted by all impartial men to effectually dispose More in his flimsy attempts at reasoning. The following extracts from the section in which Tyndale treats of ceremonies will furnish an example of his rugged, earnest method of argument. He says, How cometh it that a poor layman, having a wife and twenty children, and not able to maintain them, though all his neighbors know his necessity, shall not go with begging for Christ's sake in a long summer's day, enough to maintain them two days honestly, when, if a disguised monster come, he shall, with an hour's lying in the pulpit, get enough to maintain thirty or forty sturdy lubbers a month long, of which the weakest shall be as strong in the belly, when he cometh into the manager, as the mightieth porter in the custom house, or the best courser that is in the king's stable, who thinketh it as good a deed to feed the poor, as to stick up a candle before a post, or as to sprinkle it with holy water. As though God were better pleased when I sprinkle myself with water, or set up a candle before a block, than if I had fed or clothed or helped at his need, him he so tenderly loveth that he gave his own son unto the death for him, and commandeth me to love him as myself. Christ's death purchase grace for man's soul, to repent of evil, and to believe in Christ for remissions of sins, to love the law of God, and his neighbor as himself, which is the true worshipping of God in the Spirit. He died not to purchase such honor for unsensible things, that man to his dishonor should do more honorable service, and receive his salvation of them. This is vigorous writing, and it is well calculated to answer his purpose, 
that is, of destroying the subtleties of means of which Moore and other Romish advocates endeavored to deceive and to beguile the unwary. So keenly did the papal party feel the importance of Tyndale's book, that Moore was compelled, in spite of all his many employments, to attempt a rejoinder at once. This volume upon which he lavished great pains, Moore had to confess to be a failure. Men did not read it, and one does not wonder at their reluctance. A specimen only will suffice of this vaunted defense of the papacy upon the part of gentle Thomas More. In justice to Tyndall, this and similar passages should be remembered by all admirers of the Chancellor. This devilish drunken soul, Tyndale, doth abominably blaspheme, and call them, i.e. the schoolmen, liars and falsifiers of scripture, and maketh them no better than draught. But this drowsy drudge hath drunken so deep in the devil's dregs, that unless he wake and repent himself, the sinner, he must half ere long to fall into the mashing fat, and turn himself into draught, as of which the hogs of hell shall feed upon, and fill their bellies therewith. Nothing can justify the employment of such language, and the offence appears to be the more heinous when we remember that Tende was at that time enduring poverty and exile, while Moore was enjoying the office in favor of the king and bishops. To call such a man as Tyndale a hellhound, one of those that the devil hath in his kennel, can never be defended by any impartial reader, and our sympathies must therefore be wholly given to Tyndale in the controversy, as our judgment must also award the palm of victory to him. To Tyndale the controversy was one not merely of life and death, for he viewed the question in its eternal issues. One would not wonder if he used somewhat strong language when he realized what the papacy is in itself, and what its treatment of men, even of its adherents, means in degradation and defilement. But such scurrilous language as Moore employs at once stains his own character, and also shows his keen consciousness of having a bad case. Mm -hmm.